Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Good day, everyone. So today on the podcast, we have Jamie West, Assistant Manager at the Village Branch, and he's going to talk to us about Russell's Cave, the largest cave in Fayette County. There's many stories and folklore that surround the cave, which sits on Mount Brilliant Farm. Jamie is here to separate fact from fiction, and in this case, the facts are more intriguing than the fiction. One of the places in Lexington we get asked about the most is Russell's Cave. Most of the time, the questions are if it's true that there are catacombs under or in the cave itself. There aren't just a few fossils, but there are several mounds and Native American burials that have been found on the land around the cave and Russell Spring. Located on what is currently Mount Brilliant Farm, the cave and the spring around it has been a popular place for pleasure picnics and political rallies in the 19th century, including the famous rally featuring Cassius Marcellus Clay's fight with hired gun Samuel Brown. The water source for the cave is a tributary of the North Elkhorn Creek, a strong stream called Russell Cave Spring. In his history of Fayette County, William Perrin says the spring flows with enough force to turn a mill in both winter and summer. I tried to find how much force that is, but you have to do math with information I don't have, so we'll just take Perrin's word for it. William Perrin describes the land around the cave as beautiful scenery as can be seen among the crags of Switzerland or on the banks of the Rhine. In 1820, Professor Constantine Samuel Raffinesque visited the cave and explored it. He described it in so much detail, I'll just read it for you here. Russell Spring is a natural curiosity. It is a subterranean stream of water issuing from a cave. Both have been traced and followed for three quarters of a mile. The cave is crooked, narrow, and rather shallow, and the stream often fills it from side to side, so that one to explore it must wade and even swim in some places. Fishes are often found in it, such as suckers and catfish. In freshets, floods from rain or melted snow, the water fills the cavity. The mouth of the stream is usually one foot deep and discharges itself into the Elkhorn about a hundred steps below. The mouth of the cave is below a chain of rocky limestone cliffs where some organic fossils are embedded. A large and spacious room lies next to it in the rocks, forming another cave which is filled by rubbish at a short distance, but communicates by narrow chasms with the other cave. There is evidence of Native American and even earlier prehistoric people's use of the land around the cave. In 1882, Perrin tells us that relics of varying time periods show that the land was inhabited and used by many, many people. In 1882, mounds were still visible, and a large circular fort was still standing on some nearby farmland. One such mound was on the land of John P. Innes, and was 50 feet in diameter and about 15 feet high. Perrin says Mr. Innes drilled into it until he was ground level, and found bones, arrowheads, and other evidence indicating habitation. In other areas of the land outside of the mounds, intact skeletons were found. Perrin seems to subscribe to the idea that the mound builders were not Native Americans, but a completely separate and ancient people. He used the height of the skeletons as his main evidence, and with the average American male height being 5 foot 8 inches, several skeletons over 6 feet tall seems to be enough evidence in his mind. This thought has been debunked many times, in particular by the book Ancient Life in Kentucky by W.D. Funkhauser and W.S. Webb, published in 1928, saying that there is plenty of evidence that the mounds were built by Native Americans, and that the technology to do so was readily available at the times the mounds were estimated to have been built. If you consult this text, please be aware that it is both casually and intensely racist towards Native Americans. As of 1928, according to Funkhauser and Webb, Parts of the Russell Cave Spring were dammed, and some of the mounds were underwater at that time. Russell's Cave is named for Colonel William Russell, who was granted the land as part of his Revolutionary War service. At 15, he fought with Daniel Boone against Native Americans to colonize Kentucky, and fought several times through 1780. In addition to taking part in the Revolutionary War, he also fought in the French and Indian War. In 1789, He was elected as a delegate of the Virginia legislature and participated in the passage of the act separating Kentucky from Virginia. He represented Fayette County in the first Kentucky legislature and served a total of 13 sessions. His brother, Robert Russell, owned land in the area around North Elkhorn Creek, and together they owned so much land 
that the first election precinct there was named Russell Cave. Later, the precinct was named Dog Fennel. For more information on the later white settlers, you can consult William Perrin's History of Fayette County. Let's end this episode with some early trivia about the Russell Cave area. The Dog Fennel Precinct had the first stone schoolhouse built in 1800. Perrin says that the first school was likely taught as early as 1785. The first mill in the area was built in 1794 by George Hamilton, about a quarter mile below the cave. It washed away in a rainwater flood and was not rebuilt. A second mill was built shortly after the flood, about a mile below the site of the original by Robert Russell, and was called Hamilton's Mill. As of 1882, that mill was still in operation. Maddox Town was a hamlet established for free black people in 1871. Maddox Town and the later Warren Town were located in the Russell Cave area. Maddox Town and Warren Town both had schools for their residents, and Maddox Town had a church. The Maddox Town Church was built about 1875. We have a whole podcast about this incident, but we have to mention the political rally fight featuring Cassius Marcellus Clay and Samuel Brown. In our podcast, we reported that Samuel Brown was a hired gun, as Cassius himself always believed, but stories of the fight differ. As reported in David L. Smiley's book, Lion of White Hall, Clay was in the middle of heckling the Whig speaker, Robert Wycliffe, Jr., when Brown called him a liar and Clay hit him with a horsewhip. Someone in the crowd gave Brown a gun and he used it to shoot Cassius point blank in the chest. Fortunately for Clay, his trusty Bowie knife scabbard stopped the bullet, and unfortunately for Brown, he survived the shot. Clay launched his counterattack with his Bowie, and Samuel Brown was lucky to make it out with his life, if not his face, intact. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at lex X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.